Words are cheap, or as James expressed it, faith without works is dead. It's easy to say God is in control. It's easy to let those words spill right over our lips when we're flying high on life. Yet it's a very different story when life mercilessly and without pause beats us emotionally bloody as it seems to careen wildly out of hand. While life indeed is merciless, the Bible says that God is the God of mercy. Psalm 25 verse 10 says, All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Paul added in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 that even when we were spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins, God was still rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. We have a Savior who, as he hung naked, beaten, bloodied, humiliated, abandoned, and rejected on that Roman torture device called the cross, cried out in his humanity with a loud voice to his Father, My God, my God! Why have you forsaken me? Jesus, the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, stands today in the golden courts of glory as our high priest. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 testifies that Jesus sympathizes with us in our weaknesses, because just like you and me, he was in all points tempted, and yet he was without sin. Because the Son of Man was weighed down, beaten, and battered by life and life's actors, just like we are, we then can come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. My friend, it is okay to wonder why. It's acceptable to God to ask those difficult kind of questions. Jesus did. Your Father in heaven is neither offended by your questions, nor is he lost for answers. And yet at the end of the day, you can rest in his strong, loving, comforting, and gentle arms, knowing that all things, the marvelous and the malicious, the pleasant and the painful, the refreshing and the roiling, are working together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. We live in a broken, twisted, hurting, groaning, defiled world. And as God's children, we can't help but groan out in its brokenness because we also are broken by the presence and the power and the penalty of sin. Just don't forget you and I were created ultimately not for this world, but for eternal rest, safe in the arms of Jesus. Every day we are confronted by the conflict between God's sovereignty, his control over and in all things, and then the question of evil and man's responsibility in evil. The Bible reveals to us that the one who is holy, holy, holy is never the cause of evil. Psalm chapter 5 verse 4 says that he isn't a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with him. He loves righteousness and hates wickedness, says Psalm 45 7. And he can't be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone, James 1.13. That great father of faith in the Old Testament, Job, he questioned God's presence and purpose in his torment. And don't forget the prophet Habakkuk. He was offended by the sinfulness of God's own people, and he asked the Lord, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There's strife and contention arises. 
Therefore, the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Just as God told Job, God was doing something that his servant Habakkuk just couldn't understand. Job, Habakkuk, you, me, and billions of other believers throughout the alleys and the avenues of time must only remember the words of English preacher Charles Spurgeon. God is too good to be unkind, and he's too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. Now, I will have you follow along with me as I read Ezra chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, as we talk this morning about he is nearer today. Verse number 5. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all whose spirits God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. King Cyrus, verse 7, also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and counted them out to Sheshbazer, the prince of Judah. This is the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind, and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of gold and silver were 5,400. All these Sheshbazer took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. The nation of Judah was carried away captive to Babylon because they had failed to keep the law of the Sabbath. The Sabbath wasn't only on the seventh day of the week, on Saturday, like some modern groups play. There are organizations, denominations, groups that say you have to keep the seventh day of the week holy. That's Saturday. But what they neglect is what the Bible also teaches. In Leviticus 25, verses 1 through 12, there is a command for a seven-year Sabbath rest as well. Every seventh year, Israel was to leave the ground unplanted and unharvested. The people were to live by what each one had stored up during the previous six years. Because the nation disobeyed that seventh year of rest, God sent his people into captivity for 70 years. One year of rest for each seven years ignored. Israel had been in the land 800 years, and 490 of those years they didn't keep that Sabbath year. Now, you know I'm not a mathematician, but 490 years of disobedience divided by seven for seven years equals 70 years of captivity. When Babylon invaded Judah, they carried away both the material wealth in the form of gold and silver, as well as the human wealth in the form of kings and princes and important people. Scripture says, and history affirms, that during the 70 years of captivity, Many of these wealthy and powerful Jewish leaders and their families prospered in Babylon. Now, when the opportunity was given to them to return to Jerusalem, many of them didn't want to leave the roots that they had established in Babylon. They were like Lot and his family. They wanted to remain in Sodom but they had to be physically dragged out by those two angels. 
Now let's remember that within 50 years of Ezra, chapter 1, there was a 10-year persecution of the people that remained in Babylon. And we read that story in the book of Esther. Yes, there's a group of people, a majority of them, who stayed behind where they thought that peace and safety was going to continue just like it always had. But it wasn't very long, only 50 years, before sudden destruction swept down upon them. This brings to mind Israel's history from the time of Joseph to Moses. You find this recorded in Exodus chapter 1. It's surprising to those who don't know history how quickly a person's history or a nation's fortunes can change. Rags to riches and then back again can be God's sovereign will. What a reminder to you and me today that this world is not our home. We are, as the writer to the Hebrews put it, strangers and pilgrims on the earth seeking a heavenly country where God has prepared a city for us. And yet too many of us are willing to settle here for things on the earth. After 70 years, those who were making that journey back to Jerusalem, well, they had a lot of things to pack up and to plan for and to prepare for. And it's noteworthy, there doesn't seem to be in our text any hint of hostility between the Jews who returned and the Jews who remained in Babylon. The sovereign God leaves nothing in his creation to chance. God didn't create the heavens and the earth by time and chance as evolutionists believe. Chance would mean that the creator isn't sovereign. He's not all powerful. He is not in control of things. Chance would in fact be ruling heaven and earth instead of God. In our text, verse five says that each family unit led by the heads of the father's houses, made the decision to go or stay. You have grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren, aunts, uncles, cousins. They all went together. The family was the foundation of Jewish society. Verse 5 also tells us that these families were from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin and they included priests and Levites from the tribe of Levi. The 10 tribes in the northern kingdom of Samaria, or also known as Israel, remember they had been carried away by Assyria about 200 years prior. Some today call these the 10 tribes which are lost, or the lost tribes of Israel. Do you know how foolish it is to suggest that God could lose something, let alone his own people? First Chronicles chapter 9, verse 3, Acts chapter 26, verse 7, and Revelation 7, 4 through 8, show us that God knows exactly where those Assyrian captives were and where they are in the world today. The 10 northern tribes were not lost and are not lost now, but are preserved by God still today, just like the two southern tribes were during the 70 years of Babylon. God is faithful, my people, to his covenant promises. He will keep his word. So only a small remnant, a piece out of the whole, went back to Jerusalem from Babylon. Further on in Ezra chapter two, we read that that remnant totaled 49,697 people. God was going to fulfill his work through the few rather than through the many, through the small rather than through the great. His work was not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. Why did God insist that Judah and Benjamin return to Jerusalem? Let's suggest one reason with three promises. First, 
God promised David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that he would provide in Jerusalem a place for his people. God would never break his promise. If Jerusalem was to be a place for his people, Israel, he was going to make sure that those people got back there. The second promise is also found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God promised a throne for a descendant of David through Solomon forever. Thrones, you understand, are made for kings. And if David's descendants were lost or they were exiled forever, well, there could be no eternal throne in Jerusalem. But God would not go back on his word. And the third is that God promised Israel through the prophet Micah 300 years before Ezra that the Messiah was going to come from the tribe of Judah and the town of Bethlehem. Again, God would be faithful to his promises. Now the endeavor to go back to Jerusalem and build the temple was a holy work in the purpose of the Lord. It involved the king of Persia right down to the common man in Babylon's slums. Priests, people, and political figures all had part in God's divine plan. In the first verse, we read that the sovereign God stirred up the spirit of the pagan king Cyrus. He moved on Cyrus's heart and Cyrus responded. Those who would return to Jerusalem were all whose spirits God had moved. Verse number five. We arrogantly assume that it's our duty to move the human heart so a person is going to respond to the work of God. Yet scripture shows us something vastly different from our modern evangelistic methods. There are two dynamic examples of how God works in opening people's hearts to the gospel. The first one comes in Acts 13. Paul was preaching in the city of Antioch in Pisidia, and the Jews outright rejected his preaching. But in verse 48, we read these words. The Gentiles were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. A vast difference between what the Jews did in response to preaching as to what the Gentiles, the non-Jews, how they responded. They were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. God appointed some of those Gentiles who heard the gospel to eternal life, and then they believed. A few pages later in Acts chapter 16, we read about a group of Jewish women who were sitting by the Cronides River in Philippi, Greece. Verse 14 says, Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple, purple cloth, from the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. God moved first, then Lydia responded. God, understand, is the initiator of all of his works. He is the initiator of your salvation. In fact, he began the work of salvation from the foundation of the world. He brought Jesus into the world as a baby. Acts chapter 3, verse 23, on the day of Pentecost, Peter revealed that Jesus was, quote, delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Isaiah 53 adds that the precious detail here, that it was the Lord who laid on him, on the Messiah, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all, and it pleased the Lord to bruise him. 
He has put him, the Father has put his son Jesus to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. Isaiah 53, 6 and 10. Can you see from these few passages that the plan of salvation from its beginning to its end is the sole work of God? Now, for reasons God never tells us, and that's his prerogative, he has chosen to impart saving faith, to move the heart of the wicked by the instrument of preaching of the gospel. You and I preach, but it's God alone who opens the heart. Now, you and I might move someone's emotions by a variety of skills, more likely manipulations. You might be able to convince someone of many things by reason and by evidence, but it's God alone who opens the heart to believe on Jesus. I knew an evangelist who later became a preacher, a young man, who said he could get anyone saved in five minutes or less because he was a master manipulator. Please, be skilled. Study to show yourself approved of God. Forget the manipulation part of it. But understand, remember, and put into practice that it's not you who brings anyone to saving faith. That is the work of the man who died on the cross and now reigns in glory. Remember, it was him. It was Jesus who said in John chapter 12, verse 32, If I am lifted up, speaking of being put on the cross, if I am lifted up upon the cross from the earth through his death, on that cross, I will draw all peoples to myself. He also said in John chapter 6 that all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Ask yourself, when did the Father give you to Christ? The Bible says it was before the foundation of the earth. It was before you were born. It was before you existed in time and space. It was before you heard a sermon. It was before you walked down an aisle or repeated a prayer. You were from eternity the Father's loved gift to his Son. And today, if you have believed on Christ Jesus as your Savior, it is only because you belonged to Jesus from all of eternity. Church, that is the truth for you. But you, if you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and had your sins forgiven by what he did at the cross, today, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ it's because God has ordained you to believe the gospel about his son from eternity. Salvation is God's work from eternity to eternity, from beginning to end. Do you see how wonderful Ezra is? Every page of your Bible is filled with amazing truths, buried treasures, if you will, if we're just willing to dig a little bit. Verse 6 says that those who were around them, the people who lived around that returning remnant, encouraged or strengthened their hands with silver, gold, goods, livestock, and precious things. The text doesn't say it, but you have to know that it was God working in the hearts of the remnant's neighbors to give those things. God ensured his returning remnant had everything necessary to fulfill his will. God not only had a plan, but God provided for his plan to be carried out. Notice, God didn't provide for the remnant with miracles. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27, we have an interesting story. Jesus and the disciples were required to pay a yearly tax to the temple. 
the disciples checked in their pockets and they came up empty. And by the way, you had to have special temple money in order to pay the temple tax. So not having temple money, Jesus told Peter to go to the Sea of Galilee, throw his hook and line into the sea. And Peter obeyed. And just as Jesus said, when Peter pulled the line out, the very first fish he caught, he opened the mouth of that fish and pulled from its mouth a coin enough to pay the tax in full. Now that, my friend, is a miracle. But there are no miracles here in Ezra chapter 1. Instead, we're witnessing what we spoke of last time, We're witnesses to the unseen hand of God working in time and circumstances through ordinary means as God moves the hearts of saints and sinners, princes and paupers, to fulfill his will. It's what we call providence. I do so much enjoy the jaw-dropping spectacle that we find in a miracle. But to know that God is working right now in ways that you and I can't see, well, that's exciting enough to move me to do a holy happy dance if I did such things. The God who determined the beginning also determined the end as well as the means to get to the end. The Babylonians... Well, they'd kept all the treasures that they'd taken from the temple in Jerusalem before they destroyed it. They even inventoried every single item down to knives so that when God sent his captives back, everything they needed was going to be there. Everything would be supplied. If God called to a holy task, God would supply everything necessary to that holy task. I think that puts a nice little twist on Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. There Paul writes that in our service to him, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God never calls you without him first supplying everything that you need to obey him. Cyrus the Persian put all those things taken by Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonian back into the hands of the priests and the Levites of Israel. They were going to lead the restoration of godly worship. In the ancient world, taking things from a god's temple showed victory over that nation and the nation's deity or deities. This was the thought behind the Philistines' capture of the ark back in your Bible in 1 Samuel chapters 4, 5, and 6. The ark wasn't God, and God wasn't dependent upon the ark. And yet, when the ark was captured, the high priest by the name of Eli fell over dead. And the text tells us that when he heard the news that the Philistines captured the ark, he died because the glory had departed from Israel. Now the ark symbolized the presence of God among his people. The Philistines took the ark, they placed it in the temple of their chief God as a gift for giving them the victory in battle over Israel. One God triumphing over another God. Now, the return of the temple articles was very significant. It actually revealed the utter defeat that God of Israel had over the gods of Babylon. Let me add something about religious traditions and institutions and symbols here. Very often, these things can either hinder or they can help genuine faith. Religious objects and traditions and symbols and institutions, they hinder 
when they become the object of faith. But they help if they encourage rightful worship, just like the temple did in Israel for some. Years ago, I met a boy in the grocery store who was shopping with his grandmother. And I got talking to the boy who was probably 11 or 12 years old. And I mentioned how much I liked the shiny silver symbol that he had around his neck. It was a cross. And in the conversation, I asked him if he knew what the symbol around his neck meant. He didn't. All that he knew was that he liked the design of it. What an opportunity that I had that morning to share the gospel with him. Symbols are powerful things. The U.S. flag and our national anthem still brings tears to my eyes. But the power isn't in the American flag. The power is in what that flag stands for, what it means, what it represents. The American flag symbolizes to a patriot the beautiful, beloved philosophy of governance and living free. That as we declared our independence 250 years ago from the British, a government of the people and by the people and for the people, rather than the government controlling us, we controlled the government. That's what the flag stands for. But sometimes we wrongly put the value in the symbol, in the sign, in the shadow, rather than what it is pointing us to. How many times did Paul write about the cross? And yet he wasn't really drawing our attention to a piece of wood. He was pointing us to what happened on that wooden altar, the death of heaven's prince. One more thing about symbols. In our text, Verses 9 through 11, we have a list of gold and silver items returned to the Jews. Unlike the religious artifacts of the other people that Cyrus freed, the Jews, they had no grand or grotesque idols of half-man, half-animal gods that were being returned. The Jews had only 5,400 platters and knives and basins that were used for the slaughter of animals and the collection of that blood. Have you ever asked yourself or wondered, as you looked at this passage, as we read it this morning, did it ever cross your mind, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Jeremiah 52 verses 12 through 23 lists the significant items that were taken from the temple by Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. It's interesting, in Jeremiah 52, there's no mention of the ark. Jewish tradition says that the ark and the altar of incense were taken to Egypt by Jeremiah and then buried in a cave. The ark and the altar of incense were to be hidden away until the coming of the Messiah to set up his millennial earthly kingdom. You find this in the apocryphal book that's included in the Roman Catholic translations of the Bible, as well as in the Old King James Bible, 2 Maccabees chapter number 2, verses 4 through 10. There are speculations and rumors that the ark still exists today, that it's being safely kept in places like Ethiopia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, even Rome and Ireland. But there's absolutely zero evidence that the ark still exists in these places or anywhere else on God's green earth. All you have is traditions and rumors. There is no evidence that they are actually in any of those places. The ark may have been destroyed by the Jews to prevent it from being desecrated by the Babylonians. 
They may have destroyed it so it didn't become an object of idolatry for the Jewish people. We just don't know. And God hasn't told us. Now, that's a lot of fun, and it's interesting to speculate, like, is the, the Ark of Noah still on a mountain in Turkey? It's interesting to speculate about all these kinds of things. And people are going to continue to spend millions of dollars searching for these things. But today, you and I don't need the Ark of the Covenant, and we don't need Noah's Ark either. I personally don't think anyone is going to find, this side of Christ's return, the Ark of the Covenant. Today, you and I don't need the Ark of the Covenant because we have Jesus. The Ark of the Covenant was a symbol. It was a shadow of God's presence among God's people in God's place. That shadow was cast by the man on the cross. Today, we have Jesus. He is the Ark of the Church. He is our mercy seat. He is our atonement. He is our heavenly glory on earth. So brothers and sisters in Christ, look to Jesus. Look for Jesus because his coming is nearer today than it was when we began. Now, I am going to ask you to read our passage for next Sunday, this coming week. Next week, we are going, by God's grace, to tackle the most of the second chapter of Ezra. Read ahead so that the Spirit of God can prepare your heart and your mind as we teach next Sunday. And please, read ahead because I might need your help. As you read chapter number two, I think you'll understand why I might ask for your help next Sunday. Until then, remember, Jesus is coming. Signs and symbols are wonderful things if they point us to him. I've been raised, told, taught, and heard many people say that People like me make the Bible an idol. And there are many people who think of the Bible as some kind of an idol, that it's a book that you have to protect. It's a book that you have to treat in a certain way, these pages and its cover. Don't write in it. Don't underline in it. Be careful. And yet they place the emphasis on the page and the ink rather than what it points to. And a lot of those people are very nice people. They're very good people. They are religious people, even spiritual people. They will protect the book, but they don't read it. They don't study it. They don't know it. They don't believe it. And it's not anything that points them to Jesus. It's full of nice stories. You can buy yourself an expensive Bible that's got pictures of the Bible events in it. You might even in the beginning of it have a family tree to write important events and dates and people in it. And yet the Bible to them is merely a book rather than the living, active word of God that points us to God himself. If the Bible doesn't point you to Jesus, you have misunderstood why God gave it to us. You don't understand why it is holy. So as you read, as you study, don't look for yourself. Look for Jesus. And let the word of God, led by the spirit of God, direct you to the son of God. <laughs>